Hey everyone, quick update. Since recording this podcast, I did have a really nasty training crash. And so it is in the best interest of my safety to sit out a single track six. And it's a huge bummer, but it's okay. I'm still going to join John after each stage to cover what he learned, how he did, and we'll see you there. Welcome to a special episode of the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. Coach Jonathan Lee, we have Venton Bikes, Ivy Audrain with us, and Trainer Road's Ivy Audrain as well. We are going to talk about single track six. You excited, Ivy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> I'm trying so hard to be. It's just scary, man. Like, uh, yeah, it's intimidating, huh? Yikes. It's hard to train for stuff like this when you're, you know, uh, working life balancing human, mm -hmm. you know? Um, I just don't know what to expect. I haven't done six hard days consecutively in such a long time. And it's just, that's feels really impossible for me to try to <laughs> emulate in my sure. life right now between like, sure, there are, you know, all these, all these stages are probably going to be, and we'll talk about this, but you know, between what do you think? Like two and a half and like, maybe five hours if I have like a slower day. I don't know. Um, somewhere yeah. in that range. And it's yep. not like I wouldn't have three or four hours every afternoon to go train, but it's that, you know, I have to work a full day before that and then come back and work a full day the day after and then mm -hmm. go do it again. Like you can't just emulate a stage race while you're we have other responsibilities. It's not like a time thing is a space and energy thing, you know? Yeah. We're going to preview this race right now. And that's a good spot to start, like on the training side. Cause I think it's really logical in our minds, just like we think like, oh, I'm going to do a race and it's X miles. I need to be able to do that in training beforehand. And in rea reality, you don't. And I think it's the same thing with the six days. Like we don't have to go and do six days hard beforehand, uh, even if we did, we wouldn't be able to do it. That's just life. Like you can't like, uh, some and it people wouldn't emulate, able to, it wouldn't emulate the effort in the event either because I would be totally. so taxed from everything else in my life that that wouldn't even be quality. It wouldn't represent the race effort at all. I would just be tired yes. and just like digging a hole for myself. Yeah. So I think actually us not doing the six days beforehand, Ivy, like, you know, call me a, a, a glass half full sort of person here, but I think it's actually a sign that we're doing well. Oh, thank <laughs> so goodness. If we were okay. trying to do that beforehand, I think that that would be worrisome. So um, mm -hmm. I'm going to run through the stages really quick so then people can get some, and just like a brief overview, six days of racing, uh, almost all single track, like basically all single track on rugged, raw, real single track in British Columbia and Alberta. It's going to be pretty cool. We race in Fernie in Crow's Nest Pass in West Bragg Creek and in Canmore. Um, so two days in Fernie, two days in Crow's Nest Pass, one day in West Bragg Creek, one in Canmore. The stages in terms of what we're, we're going to cover a total of just 149 miles in the race, which doesn't sound like a whole lot. But then if you start to look at like the elevation gain, that's 240 kilometers and we cover. When you look at the elevation gain though, it, it steps up quite a lot. It's 24,434 feet gained as that's 7,447 meters gained in those six stages. So that's significant. That's not small. <laughs> uh, and then if you look at like the climbing ratio, it's pretty darn, like it's pretty darn high. We do a lot of it's up or it's down and there's not a whole lot of flat. Um, a lot of that is just due to the terrain. Um, if you look at like the average, this is just a rough estimation, but like average climbing gradient, I kind of broke it down to like 6%, but that doesn't really tell the whole story because these climbs are really steep. So we're going to have steep climbs to deal with every day. Uh, every day there are climbs over 15%, sometimes upwards of 20%. Uh, it's going to be steep stuff. We're going to have elevation. We're going to be roughly uh, somewhere around like 2000 meters uh, at the high point, uh, somewhere around 7,000 feet, but then lower, uh, anything lower than that as well. So that's the race. Uh, it's six days GC. So it's a it's time. It's not an omnium or anything else like that. Uh, but Ivy, you and I, I don't think we have any expectations in terms of like, uh, where we want to be like, you aren't shooting for X placement in the field, right? No. Yeah. Not, not <laughs> no, death. No. Not death is what I'm shooting for. <laughs> yeah. 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 Same. I, I think that this year the field actually looks quite strong too. And you know, if I was to place top 20, it seems like that would be like a great outcome. I don't really know. It's hard to tell. Instead, I'm just going for a race where I feel like I 
am able to execute well every day and I don't make any big mistakes. I've done this race before. If you want to listen to those episodes, you can look, listen back. Uh, Nate, Chad, and I did single track six. And, uh, I think Chad just chose after stage one, like I want to do half the days instead of all six. It was a very unconventional take. I've never heard somebody do that in a stage race, <laughs> uh, or you just kind of choose to do half. And then, mm-hmm. um, and then Nate, uh, famously, as he says, broke his top tube with his leg. Uh, I don't know if that was the case or if he crashed, I know he crashed. And then I got concussed myself on stage five and I don't remember much and I couldn't finish. And I was, it was so sad, um, to do that. So. I have some retribution just to come back and finish this race. I cannot wait to do that. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's in some of my favorite trains. It's going to be pretty great. Uh, Do you have any like general or comprehensive like pacing strategies? Because I do. uh, I mean, look like with climbs this steep, you're going to be forced outside of like where you would pace. Like it's just the way it's going to be. It's more like when I can control the pace, I want to ride tempo and not ride below that when I can control the pace. Mm -hmm. That's kind of like my, my goal in terms of pacing. And I know that sounds really weird, but I just, I can't, it's going to be like 20% climbs for really long at certain points or, you know, steep switchbacks or something. And in those situations, you're going to spike your power way up and you just can't, you can't govern yourself to the point where you're not doing that because otherwise you'll fall over. So you have Mm -hmm. to, you have to get up the climb. So yeah, it's just when I can control, I'll be riding tempo, but Really, like my main goal is just to be strong. And I know that sounds super vague, but I, at Cape Epic, uh, there were points when I would finish stages and I felt really strong. And there were points when I didn't feel very strong. And the days where I felt strong were typically ones where I paced intelligently and I wasn't getting brought out by other athletes. Instead, I was just like, you know, the terrain forced me to do what it did. But then when I had a choice, I was riding intelligently and that always helped me finish strong. And that's kind of the goal here. So yeah, tempo Mm -hmm. when I can control it, I guess. Does that answer the question? Yeah, totally. I think mine's pretty similar, although I acknowledge um, on those days when we are forced to, um, you know, go into those really hard efforts when the climb is so steep, for me to settle, you know, by by the time we get to day four, five, six, for me to settle back into even just tempo might be too much. And yeah. so mm-hmm. I think I need to like allow myself sometimes like it's going to be so hard and weird to do to be like, I'm racing, I'm in a bike race, but just to be like, I just need to chill. I'm just going to chill on this section. And if the climb is a low enough grade mm-hmm. that allows for it for me to just like really just mentally and physically just relax for a few minutes, like I'm going to do it, um, which sucks and isn't like a great race strategy for a result and doesn't make it sound like I'm very confident in my fitness, but I'm not dude. I don't know how my body's going to react like on days like this, you know? And so I would way, way rather like have a little bit left. Like, so what if I undershoot? Like, oh no, big deal. Like if I really (laughs) feel like it, you know, like if I really feel like it and like, I'll, I'll be aware of, you know, the profile of each of the day. And, um, I'm like, whoops, I played it too conservative. Well, guess what? Now I have a 30 minute climb at the end of this stage and I'll just go bananas. It'll be fun. You know? Sure. So exactly. I would way rather do that. Than fresher. Just like, <laughs> yeah. 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 Totally. And <laughs> yeah. then the next day I'll have like a little more in the tank and I would just rather do that than be, than be like, I have to, if I can do this and maybe I can get top five, like, No, I just need to like be chill and enjoy myself and like learn a bit more about how this kind of racing and pacing like works for me and how I should do it. Um, I just don't know that part of myself as an athlete yet. So it's very cool. This is a really good example of going into something that's like new and how to set expectations. And it's really just based on what you know you can do. You aren't guessing about what you think or don't know you can do. Instead, it's just like, this is what I can do. And this is what I'm going to control. I think it's a really smart approach, Ivy. So thanks. I want to talk on the training side. We're going to talk about equipment and we're going to talk about nutrition and what we're going to do for this race. Uh, hopefully it can give you some actionable takeaways. If you find something that we've missed, let us know down in the comments below on YouTube, or if you're listening on the podcast, you can go to trainerroadcom slash podcast or find us on Instagram, myself, Ivy, go to the trainer road Instagram and share your, your thoughts on what we're going to do for prep. First things first on fitness. Um, my training, I've been, you know, following, never look at my training in terms of like what exactly to do on train road. I'm always testing different things. So like some of the workouts that you'll see, they don't look probably like what you would see in some of our plans. 
Uh, reason is because we're testing new stuff. However, uh, I'm in the cross country marathon plan right now, uh, but I really want to take some time to talk about like just the last few weeks in terms of where our forms at Ivy. So like ideally I, two weeks ago, I would have been like getting to the point or really like two weeks ago and a week ago where it would have just been like peak in terms of like, uh, not peak peaks, a bad word, but it'd be like a lot of training load, a lot of specificity and everything else. And then I'd be tapering down. I got sick and that is, has had an impact on me. And as a result, I kind of took like a, I took a week and a half almost com or completely off the bike and really two weeks off the bike. And then I eased my way back in with some sweet spot work instead of getting, um, and going through stuff instead of just like, you know, trying to hammer myself home. I let it after training know that I was sick. It adjusted my workouts for me. It even dropped my FTP for me, which is super helpful because I'm in the specialty phase. Super cool new feature. If you want to use that, go over to trainerroad.com, sign up. You can go to early access and turn on AI FTP detection. It's a really cool feature. I was in the specialty phase and it noticed that I was going to struggle with workouts and I was struggling with workouts. And it's like, Hey, we're going to drop your FTP just by just a little bit here, adjust your levels and it's going to make things easier. And it's amazing. So that features in beta. It's really cool. Uh, you can go give it a shot, but now like just this week, I've had really good performances on two extremely hard workouts and I feel pretty good. And after this week, I am coasting into the event in terms of like doing short workouts. I'm really dialing the volume back. I want to err on the side of freshness coming into this. Um, and that's kind of where I'm at. So when I talk about that, like all, if I, if I'm feeling fatigued at all coming in over the next two weeks, I will swap that day for an endurance day and I will just go easy or I will skip the day altogether. Like I'm not going to hesitate to do that. I have confidence in all the training that I've done leading up to this, that come race time, it's going to be there and it's not going to go away because I'm dropping things down over the next two weeks. I'll do short and intense workouts. That's what trainer roads planning for me is like, you know, 45 minute workouts or one hour instead of two hours and that sort of thing. And yeah, I'm just going to keep following the plan and I think it'll be good. Um, I, but yeah, the taper, I feel like is huge, right? I mean, you've done six day of racing before, just not mountain bike racing. And like you come in, not like if you come in overcooked, it gets really hard. I'm totally blowing the tape right now, but it's for a very good reason. <laughs> <laughs> you are. It's true. I yeah. am. Yeah. So, um, uh, in Montana where I live and in a lot of, um, mountainous areas, there are these things called fire lookout towers and the forest service utilizes them. Um, they're just like high above, uh, usually on one of the tallest peaks in the region. And they would have a forest, like a ranger posted up in there for the entire fire season to, uh, be scoping and searching for the first signs of an, of a forest fire and alert the forest service so they can, you know, dispatch forest fighters, like address it immediately. Um, and so that's what they were used for, like really cool structures, 360 windows, like, you know, total view so that you can look out for the fires. Um, a lot of them aren't used for that purpose anymore. I don't know if like technology is changed in the forest or you work for the forest service. Tell me why, they're not yeah. used as I much as they used to be. I also wondered the same thing. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so now Please you use can. Them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Put them uh, out fast. But, but the ones that aren't being used by the Forest Service now can be rented recreationally for camping, which is so cool. But it's so hard to get into them. It's kind of one of those things where you're on the site to book it. And if it opens, you don't know when it's going to open sometimes. Mm. and uh, Or if it says it opens at. Um, it's like T-Swift tickets. Yeah, eight yeah. eight <laughs> yeah. o'clock mountain time you're like looking at the seconds and at eight oh 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 one you like add to cart like it's crazy it's so hard to get one and um months and months and months ago i've been trying to get one for years and i very luckily got a cancellation um just caught it being available and so booked it and this next week um july 5th 6th 7th are the days that i get to go um, and so I'm going to bike pack there. Um, nice. And with, with my boyfriend and a few friends and it's going to be, uh, the ride isn't horrible. It'll probably be six ish hours. Um, mm -hmm. but you know, bike packing pace, we're on loaded down bikes, like super chill pace. Um, so the first and last day we'll be riding there and back. And then the day in the middle, we're just going to hang out at the lake and have kind of a choose your own adventure day. I might ride for a couple hours or something. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to have like a totally restful week. <laughs> <laughs> no, you will not. At but all it's like next week. Emotionally and psychologically fulfilling though. 
Yeah, it's going to be great. And I'm going to try really hard to keep it chill. Um, And, you know, I'm with people that support me and care about me and aren't going to, you know, try to push the pace beyond what I want to do. And if they do, I'll (laughs) just catch them later, you know? So um, we'll just catch up at the next snack stop. Like I'm not going to stress and rush and pedal any harder than I need to. Um, And yeah, that does not set me up well to feel really fresh going into this race, but it's something I would never miss. Um, so I'm going to make it work, make the best of it, you know, really mm-hmm. focus on recovering and chilling those days after bikepacking and yeah, just try to be as recovered as I can before driving up to BC. Yeah. Uh, the sort of workouts I've been doing for this, a lot of just in the cross country marathon plan, and there are some changes to what might be in production now, but a um, lot of, uh, sustained work, like threshold work. That's quite hard. Um, and like longer intervals I've been doing like, uh, 15 minutes and above, but up to like, you know, twenties and that sort of thing. And quite a few of them and hard start sweet spot workouts and hard spot, th- hard start threshold workouts. Those are really tough. Um, and then also then on the VO two side, it's just been like the on offs is more of what I've been doing. So having those sort of workouts has been really helpful for, or will be really helpful for this sort of terrain where you're just forced to like repeat hard efforts because of switchbacks or because, or, or hold sustained power because it's just a really long, steep climb because Canadians don't believe in not making or making chill climbs <laughs> they're always steep. Yeah. Seems. So, uh, thank you, Canada. Uh, so I'm, I feel like my fitness is quite good. I'm not where I've been in previous years or anything else. Um, but again, my goal is to go in and have a performance where I feel like I am performing well when I can choose I'm riding tempo and, uh, yeah, I think I'm good there. How about the technical skills side, Ivy? Cause you've never done like you've done XCOs and you've done all that sort of stuff. I've mentioned before on the podcast that I feel like you have really, really good technique. Like your position on the bike is fantastic. Um, Thank you. how are and, and I, you have a new bike as well. That's probably going to help with this, but how are you feeling on the technical skills side coming into this? Is that a concern for you? No, not at all. I feel totally solid. Um, I'm on the new nice. bike. I just built up a Santa Cruz Blur, um, and I have a Fox 34 Stepcast fork on it, and um, nice. great race face wheels that um, I just like. I feel really, really comfortable on it. So, um, yeah, I don't feel like that's going to uh, inhibit my confidence in any way. Is um, it Blur TR? Is it the the one with like the longer travel instead of the yes. super racy XCO one? Correct. Nice. Yeah. That'll be perfect then. Yeah. 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 It's awesome. Um, I really got it to be my do all bike, um, for those of us that can't have like a full stable of hardtail mm. and, you know, long travel XE and enduro bike. I can't do that. So this is going to be my, <laughs> you know, do all, um, yeah, I'm feeling, uh, I just don't feel like the things that, um, make me nervous riding technically are just like really big drops or, um, uh, I mean, I feel like that's actually almost it at this point, like, um, drops where your, uh, speed management is really crucial. Um, Mm -hmm. and I just don't feel like there's going to be anything in the course where they would put in a feature like that, where you need to mitigate or like manage your speed appropriately ahead of time and know what to do. I just don't feel like they're going to throw anything like that at us. And They've mentioned one spot on the stage to Big Bear. I want to say it's like stage four. I could be wrong there. Or they said that it's like uh, there's a there's a drop or something, but there's going to be like a ride around and there's going to be signs and there's going to be everything else. So like mm-hmm. uh, last time I rode this, like there were steep sections and there was everything else like that, but there was nothing where it was like, if you didn't get over this, like, you know, it could really mm-hmm. like, you know, it was high risk or anything. So. Yeah. And it's it's about technical me is, terrain for sure, but it's not like, you know, it's not crazy huge drops or anything. So. Yeah, totally. And the thing about me is I have no shame. And if I feel too tired and like uncomfy to do something, I will get my butt off the bike and just walk <laughs> a few steps. Like I do not care. Um, but I could see myself being, uh, I experienced this at Soldier Hollow, the UCRS last weekend where like things that are normally really chill when I'm redlined, just feel totally like dangerous and unmanageable. And so I don't think I'll ever be in that kind of like super high intensity, like redline space while I'm at single Mm -hmm. track six. But, um, 
I am cognizant of when I get there and when I need to like play it cool and be conservative. Yeah, that's the key. Um, I feel like I'm strong on the technical skills side, no concerns there. Um, the bike I have, which we'll get into in just a bit here, like I feel like it's perfect for it. Big difference from the last time because I don't really know what caused me to crash, but last time I spent for, so for a week, two weeks prior to single track six, I was at Whistler for a week and I completely wore giant holes in my hands from riding bike park trails. And like, I had huge blisters. I mean, like the outside pad of my hand was one giant blister that ended up ripping open. And then I developed another one and another one, like it was that bad. And then I had blisters all over my hands, um, just cause it was bike park was intense. So, um, I do not have that situation now. I've been doing some strategic things to get my hands tougher. Uh, I know this sounds silly, but, uh, for example, like lotion, I know this sounds overkill. I'm using rubber gloves. We live in a super dry climate. You have to put on lotion like every day. That's just how it works. I put on rubber gloves before I put lotion on. That's just like what I do to keep my hands so that they aren't, and they're a little drier. It's easier for them to stay tough. Uh, I've been working and uh, doing some like yard work and everything else and not wearing gloves. So like when I've got my hands on the tools or like digging something out in the dirt, I'm just getting my hands dirty and getting them rougher. And in my training rides, I've been riding without gloves. I plan to use gloves absolutely in the race, but I've been doing all these things to try to get my hands tougher. And if we don't have any blisters, we have tons of calluses. They're really rough. And so that's, I feel like last time I had those, I was having to grab my hands or grab the bars really weird all race. And I had mm -hmm. liquid band aid and super glue and everything was taped up and I couldn't hold my bars right. And it was really rough. And then I also had a problem with my fork was like extremely harsh and it shouldn't have been, but it was just like, it needed to be serviced and I didn't service it right before all those things added up to me riding in a compromised position. And I'm sure that that contributed to me crashing out. Hmm. I'm really engineering against that this year with making my hands tough. My suspension will be freshly serviced before this race. I've already arranged with our local shop to be able to do that on the right timeline. Uh, that's all taken care of. And yeah, on the technical skills side, I am just so excited to ride proper BC trails. Like they're amazing. It's so much fun every day that I rode in that race. And it's a different course, but every day I rode last year or last time I did this, it was like the best trail ever. And it was mm -hmm. just every day. It was like the best trail ever. And it just got better. It was so cool. So I'm stoked. That's awesome. Uh, equipment wise, Ivy, you already went through your bike and what you're using. Um, can I ask you like spares and what you're planning to carry and like uh, everything else on you? Uh, so I'm set up with, um, my tires are Maxis recon race 2.35s right now. Nice. Um, I think that's the right tread for, um, what the dirt is like up there. I think it's pretty similar to here in Montana. We're not far geographically. And, um, mm -hmm. I, I think that's going to be the right tire. I am going to bring a whole other wheel set. Um, just in case nice. same wheel set, um, different, uh, I can't remember what tires are on there right now. Um, but yeah, that I'll bring an extra wheel set just in case, um, for spares on the bike or wait, yeah. is that a different question? Yeah, exactly. Like, uh, we can cover the spares off the bike. Like, are you bringing any extra parts or anything else like that that you plan oh, other than the wheels? Well, yeah, the, the extra wheel set, um, I'll bring, um, extra cleats, uh, an extra set of grips. I don't know, just in case like I crash or like one, uh, I don't know. I just am paranoid, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> extra batteries, stuff like that. Um, what else? I think that's all I'll bring for spares. Um, yeah. For on the bike, carry on the bike, like during the race to, for spares and tools and such. Um, <clears throat> I'll carry a Dyna plug with, um, like a good number of extra, plugs um that beyond just like what's on the actual dyno plug itself um just in case mm -hmm. and um on the bike i'll bring a tube and a couple of co2s probably um and a tire lever and a like the smallest allen wrench i can pack and i think that's it yeah i think we'll probably have like creek crossings and stuff but uh, if I really need to lube my chain, I could probably just stop at an aid station. So I'm not going to pack chain lube on the bike, but then on the bike, I'm carrying one of the tubo Lido mountain bike tubes. They're like really, they pack up really small. Um, they're also way lighter than like a big, heavy 29 inch mountain bike tube. Mm -hmm. So I'm carrying a tubo Lido tube, 
I'm carrying a master link as well, like a spare quick link uh, that I can have just in case the chain breaks, I can try to break it and then go through there. A uh, small multi-tool with a chain breaker uh, that I'll be bringing. Uh, I'm also bringing a Dyna plug and I'm gonna have a fat end and a pointed end uh, in the Dyna plug. You can have both. Uh, for those wondering, Dyna plug is like a really cool, uh, very good tire plugging tool. I like it more than the little Genuine Innovations bacon strip ones. I feel like those things hardly ever seal, whereas the Dyna plug ones really do a good job. I haven't had good luck with the Stan's darts, so I don't use those. Um, so, and then I'm gonna be bringing also within my uh, my bike, I'm riding a, uh, S-Works Epic Evo. And within there, I have like a swap box that's on the frame and it's like my storage little box. And within that, I'm going to carry a handful of spare Dyna plugs in a little Ziploc bag. All that stuff is going to be in Ziploc. I'll also carry a spare battery as well. And then of course, CO2 um, with a spare or two CO2s uh, lever and then also um, a nozzle to be able to do it. I can't remember who it was, but somebody joked about putting like cement mix in that little uh, compartment for your bike. <laughs> I can't remember yeah. like what context it was in, but someone was like trying to slow you down or there were, it was like a competitor of yours and I don't, I can't yeah. remember what it was, but yeah. Please no. Yeah. Please don't do it. So, um, so that's what I'm going to carry for spares on the bike off the bike. I'm bringing spare grips. Like you said, Ivy, I'm bringing a spare saddle just cause you never know mm -hmm. uh, if there's some sort of crash where that could happen. Um, I am also bringing uh, spare pedals because a pedal strike that could cause something, you know, or then you're stuck hoping to find a bike shop. That's spare cleats. Idea. I'm making a list now. <laughs> yeah. Spare shoes as well. Um, I have two pairs of shoes and I'm going to bring a spare pair of shoes because I've had shoes mess up uh, mid race before. And that's kind of a pain. Uh, spare tires. I don't have a spare wheel set, so I'll have to see if I could borrow one from somebody uh, because I do think that that's a good idea. Ivy to have a spare wheel set. Um, I'm I think also between bringing, the two of us, you know, hopefully we yeah. both, yeah, I'm happy to share that one. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, that'll hopefully work. Hopefully we yeah. both don't need spare wheels entirely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Agreed. Uh, I also have a twist lock on my bike. So the I'm riding a medium S-Works Epic Evo, like I said, and I have the fork. I swapped over to the lockout version instead of just like, like the remote lockout instead of just the little lever thing on there. And then on the shock, I swapped out the head on, on the shock so that I could run a lockout that was in the pull out position. There's like the pull in and pull out Have the pull out one. I changed the, the shim stack tune inside that shock. And then I'm running slightly heavier shock oil also then I can get it to, yeah. <laughs> so like, so it'll work really well. Um, but the frailty and all of that is the lockout, the twist lock. Um, they are known for like breaking so that it might not lock out. So I'm bringing a spare twist lock just in case. So, um, so I'm going to have a spare twist lock and then spare cables just in case something happens really weird. And somehow one of those mm -hmm. cables gets torn. Uh, I'm bringing spare brake pads and I'm also bringing spare rotors. Those are things mm. that I want to bring there. Spare chain as well. And then I also bring a handful of chain rings. So like a 30, a 32, a 34, uh, because, and I might even bring the 36. I have like 30 through 38. Um, I don't know if the 36 would be helpful on the last stage. It seems flattish, but no I don't know way. if we'd have fast sections. But. There's no way you would ever get in the... The last stage is different. It's a little weird. It's more like a uh, XCO ish. And it looks like there might be some fast sections, but I could be wrong. I'm just planning on using the 32, honestly, Judging for the you. majority yeah. of this. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, <laughs> but having them like it's, you know, it's probably not too difficult. So it is a lot of spare parts. Um, it's about the same that I brought to Cape Epic, uh, spare tires too. I'm bringing uh, one spare tire per for front and rear. Um, I'm not bringing mud tires. I'm just going to make do. I have Maxis Aspen 2.4s and that's what I'm going to run. And I don't mm -hmm. have any plans to change that. So, mm -hmm. um, I could bring forecasters. I have some, but I just don't think it's going to be that sort of muddy. And if it is, I'm used to riding the Aspens in sketchy conditions too. So good plan. Um, I'll, yeah. I'll be running inserts in there. They're the tubal light inserts and I'll probably be running my tire pressure somewhere around like, uh, 15 and a half and 16 and a half PSI. And I'll be weighing somewhere around 150 pounds. So, uh, you can run really low pressure with those inserts and it really makes for like a really good, uh, dynamic with the bike. Nice. I'm trying to think if I'm doing anything else, I'm not using togs or anything else on there to be able to change my hand position. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Um, yeah, nothing special there. Uh, okay. 
let's get into uh, kits. Are you doing anything like, are you bring? I'm going to bring like a uh, wide range. I have vented kits and like non vented kits, but um, I don't yeah. know if you're doing anything special there. Uh, I, I will. Um, LEL made me some great team kit. Um, and they're, um, yeah, my Jersey is like, it's great. And will it's really lightweight as it is. I am going to bring mm -hmm. LEL makes a, um, a, like super mesh. It's called the Diablo Jersey. And it's like almost it's like almost see-through, but it's just so <laughs> lightweight and just really nice on really, really, really hot days. And so I'm going to pack that just in case we do have a like crazy bonkers hot day. Um, mm -hmm. but other than that, just a standard kit they, that they made me, um, wicks really well. And I do have a couple, um, road suits, the kinds that like look like a skin suit and, um, have pockets in the back though. Um, mm -hmm. and those are really thin and really, but like more than anything are just really, really comfortable. Yes. And so, um, I could see myself, uh, wearing that on a couple of the days. Um, if I'm starting to be like grumpy and feel uncomfortable and want to just like <laughs> feel like I'm in a buttery soft kit, cause I'll have plenty of other places to carry all my stuff. You know, I don't want to have a bunch sure. of stuff in my Jersey pockets anyways. So, um, yep. yeah, that's my kit plan. Nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, I wish that I had two in one skin suits and stuff like those ones I love from Quare or like other brands make them too. Like you mentioned, I don't, um, but I am going to be bringing a mix of stuff, some vented stuff and some not, uh, I'm using a white helmet, uh, cause that might help with temperature. We're expecting like in the twenties C, um, so like somewhere, you know, like mid sixties to mid to high seventies basically is like what we're expecting. So it doesn't sound very hot, but if you're riding an ambient heat and it's like a really rocky high descent, that sort of thing, it can feel really hot and you can mm -hmm. really be cooking. So, uh, so yeah, that's what we're doing there. Uh, nutrition <clears throat> on the bike. What are you planning on taking in? And do you have any idea of like how many grams per hour you want to take in IV or sodium? Um, that sort of thing? Oh, no grams per hour. Like that's such a hard, um, hard thing for me to be able to calculate and aim for when I'm just trying to do as much as I can, honestly. Sure. Um, if I can eat what is equivalent to, um, like four between three and four gels an hour, I mm -hmm. would be so stoked. Um, and those are SIS gels. Um, and I would alternate, I would do mostly non caffeinated ones and then maybe do like one caffeinated one every like hour and a half or something. It may be if I was really dragging. Um, but that's my goal. Uh, it won't cool. come from all gels that I'm going to have blocks and, um, not a ton of really solid food, but I definitely will take some. Um, and then maybe some candy, um, just like Haribo's. Um, so that's my solid or like food stuff, food plan for on the bike. And then, um, my fluid, and electrolyte stuff will depend a little bit upon, um, like aid stations, mm -hmm. but I am going to, um, bring a camel back and then have two bottles. And then, um, if I feel like, uh, yeah, I don't know what is, I need to look more closely at what our aid station <laughs> situation is on all these stages. I, I love how contrary our approaches are to the nutrition side of things. Somebody's listening to this is going to totally identify with Ivy. And then like, you know, a handful of us nerdy folk are probably going to identify with my approach. We're going to have a aid stations for sure. Um, mm -hmm. three to four aid stations. It looks like each day. Oh, nice. See, we'll I didn't have. even know. I'm just like, I'm just preparing to be alone all day <laughs> and just Canadian need wilderness. to be self sufficient. <laughs> yeah. yeah, seriously. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. then if things go wrong and you like, you know, there's a ton of people at the aid station and you don't want to like, I'll have everything I need. <laughs> yeah. I'm bringing the Usui. I think it's called the Usui Outlander Pro. Uh, it's their white pack. It's like their hyper light one. Uh, I've got a two liter reservoir in there. Um, if you're packing in ice and everything else and assuming all that ice melts, then sure you get your two liters out of it. But in most cases it's tougher to fill that. Considering that I expect every race to be somewhere around like two and a half to three and a half hours for me, hopefully uh, in those situations, uh, I'm going to have, I have two bottle cages on my bike and on those, I want to have like small bottles on there that I fill up, um, all the way. And then in my hydration pack, I can fill up the rest. <clears throat> so in a normal day, um, 
And in some cases I might, if I know it's going to be shorter, I might not put bottles on the bike or I might just put one bottle on the bike. Cause the reason I want to have the hydration pack is it's way easier to drink on single track, heavy days. When you have a hydration pack, it's a lot harder to find times to be able to get your bottle out, uh, when it's really tricky, it's either really steep or technical or that sort of thing, but a hydration pack, you can just kind of pop that in your mouth and, and, and drink when you want, and then just kind of let it sit there in your mouth when you aren't drinking, uh, it can be really helpful. So, um, but I'm just planning on drinking roughly somewhere around 750 milliliters per hour in terms of fluid. That's typically what delivers well for me. And then if I have 750 milliliters per hour there, and then I'm taking in almost a thousand milligrams in sodium, I'll do that through my own custom drink mix that I make where I just mix, uh, glucose and fructose and sodium. Uh, and I put that together and then also precision hydration has these little capsules. So I have a bit of sodium in my drink and then I'll take up uh, those capsules. I'll do two of those an hour. And with that, I should get, I should hit my thousand, uh, that I need per hour for carbs, uh, grams of carbs per hour. I'm going to be doing that all through my drink mix, but I will be carrying gels as well, just in case I need that. And I need to like, you know, get an aid station bottle. That's just water. Uh, for that, I'm going to be drinking in somewhere between hundred and 120 grams an hour, uh, for every day, all throughout the race. Um, and during when I'm on the bike, so a thousand milligrams roughly of sodium per hour and about a hundred to 120 grams of carbs per hour. And I think that that should, I've been testing that beforehand and I'm doing quite well with it. And that's what seems to work quite well for me. So that's something I'm going to do for the nutrition side. Uh, just drink mix gels are my backup plan if I need them. And, uh, that's worked well, worked well at Cape Epic too. Mm -hmm. I'm going to uh, keep, um, oh. one bottle, not drink mix, um, in case I want to splash some water on myself, uh, or That's just a good like point. if I sometimes just my mouth gets like sticky and I really want to break from like sugar and just to have like clear water, like really helps my state of mind. So I'm going to keep one smaller bottle, um, just water. Yeah. That's a good point on the pouring part that just does like a huge help. And for me, I don't want to have all the liquid in my hydration pack because all that weight is then on your back and it makes it tougher. You just feel more lethargic, not as mobile on your bike. Um, so, uh, you know, theoretically I could have enough room in my hydration pack to ride for like four hours mm -hmm. and, uh, or roughly not quite four hours, like three and a half hours. I could pack it all in there, but if I can balance it across the bottles, then maybe I just balance it across the hydration pack in one bottle. And then I have a pour bottle that's just ice water. And that pours on me. That could be good. At every aid station that we pass, if they have water, I'm taking it and pouring it on myself for sure. If they have that option, like I'm not mm. passing that up. So, uh, okay. Uh, outside of on the bike stuff off the bike, what are we planning to eat? Like, uh, we talked about in the previous episode in terms of, you know, our breakfast, you know, rice, eggs for me, pancakes probably, or waffles for you, Ivy. Um, and then post race, Sorry, it's super boring. Probably just going to have more rice and eggs. Like <laughs> I'm going to cook extra and then have it for after the race. And then I can just like get something in me immediately after the race. Mm -hmm. And I just try to eat absolutely everything I can afterward and stay away from fiber basically all through the race is what I'm going to try. Do you have any, uh, what are you planning on? Yeah, I'm going to eat uh, so much more than I want to. I'm going to be like uncomfortable. Yeah. For this Because like, that's how like, you end up week. having good races, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm going to like thank myself when I, if I feel okay on the bike, um, as a result, but yeah, I'm going to eat a lot more than I'm really comfortable eating. And so for me, that'll look like, um, doing really nutrient dense, uh, carbs. So no, like I'm not going to probably eat a slice of bread the whole time I'm there. Like anything I'm eating mm -hmm. has to be just like super dense. Otherwise, like I fill my stomach up with stuff that isn't really, you know, um, helping me refuel. So mm -hmm. that said, like, I think I'm going to save pancakes for mornings when I just like, feel like I cannot eat rice anymore and just like really don't You're want the to. rice and eggs train. Yes. Yeah, totally. I mean, I, yeah. I do it. You well, that's I. the thing you is do like it all the time. Anyway, I do it all the time, but there are yeah. just like complications and limitations with, um, camping and it uses yeah. so much camping fuel to, and time to like cook rice on a, like, in a jet boat on like a camping stove without like a rice cooker. It's not like I can just like set it and be like, and keep getting ready. See you later. So I'm going to try to find some like instant rice packets that I can just like yes. pour hot water into or something. 
Mm -hmm. um, or just um, set into boiling water. I don't know exactly how that works, but um, yeah, I have some some stuff to do before we go. (laughs) I think that we have, so all, and we should cover that. I'm uh, borrowing, thank you, Tony, my friend Tony, for lending me your van. It's amazing. Uh, Van's going to have a microwave in it. So we'll be able to use that to be able to like heat up the rice and everything else that we would need. I always do like the Ben's original rice packets. They're like, you can find them at a ton of grocery stores. And all you do is you take the packet and you put it in the microwave. You just like, like peel open the corner and then you put it in the microwave and it steams itself. It's not the tastiest rice, but it gets it done. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm planning on just getting a ton of those packets, like a huge amount and bringing them. They also have like different flavor ones that you can get. So then you can keep it a bit interesting after the ride. So you're not just doing like white rice before every time. Um, yeah, I got, uh, have a few packets of that. Um, it's like back packers pantry or whatever it's called. Mm-hmm. Uh, mango sticky rice. Ooh, so that'll be, that'll be like a nice treat when I'm tired of rice and eggs and soy sauce. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to be sleeping in the van, Ivy, you're car camping. You have like a mm-hmm. kind of dialed car camping setup that you've worked on over the years. So, mm-hmm. and we're going to be at campgrounds all along the way. We're not doing like the transportation hotel package or anything else like that. We're just doing it this way. Uh, we feel that the reason that we're doing that is because it allows us to control a bit more, like instead of having to get a shuttle to go somewhere or instead of like, you know, paying for a rental car, that's just like sitting there for most of the time throughout the whole race. This allows us to then like, when I finish, I can go straight back or I'm right there by the, the RV or the, the, the van and Ivy the same. And if there's a day where we need to drive each other, then Ivy and I can work together and kind of like leave one car in one spot and help out. It'll work out well. Um, and the sleeping arrangements will be great because you've got your setup that you've tested and then I'll be in the van. I haven't tested it yet, but um, I'm bringing my own pillow, earplugs, eye mask. I have all that stuff. So I'm only worried about temperature. And so what I do have is like a really hefty portable battery that I'll make sure is charged before I go that has a USB port. And then I found a USB fan, um, Uh like a little, like a, it's probably six inches in diameter or something or six inches across, like just a, you know, small fan. Um, and that could be great for me, uh, to, if I get super hot in the car at night, um, to be able to have some moving air on me. So I'm I'm excited about that. It does drop down to like the forties and fifties at night. It looks like, or fifties in terms of Fahrenheit. So like down into like the high teens, which should be good. Yeah. But like you mentioned when your body is like recovering (laughs) or when you had just a big day, like you and I are the same. And this is just like, I feel like an oven. We turn into the sun. (laughs) Yeah. It's seriously, it's so hot and it doesn't matter. Like, Yeah. yeah. Um, I have like every once in a while in the winter when I have a really hard, like, couple consecutive workouts and I'm just cooking, like it'll be winter and snowing and I'll need to crack my window. Like yeah. I just turn into yeah. a furnace. So I'm a little worried, but the good news is I think every spot where we camp, we're close to a body of water, uh, usually rivers, uh, mm-hmm. like in creeks. So we can go and like lay down in the, I can lay down in the Creek and let the water run over me and just like hang out in there and really cool off my core temp pretty quick. Amazing plan. Air mattress, yeah. tether it to something float in water, sleep in water. <laughs> <laughs> Ivy, I do not think that's safe, but I, I do like, I, I like where your head's at. Yeah. Cooling. Um, uh, thinking of like other parts that have end up affecting the stage race, uh, we're going to be eating it as much as we can. Like during Cape Epic, I remember we, I would eat like two to three cups of rice and that's dry measured cooked rice. And with eggs and I would eat that in the morning. It's a huge bowl, like a huge bowl. And it was hard to get down. And then after the race, I would have like a small, like kind of like a backpacker meal, but they were like microwave meals that they had. So I might end up, I haven't found a backpacker pantry style or like I did the prime or primal. I don't know what they're called. They're like these things I got at at a REI. They are not the most delicious things, but post race, it's a good way to get in calories and probably a good idea. So I might have like something that's just like really easy to take in for right after the race. And then I think I ate like, uh, after Cape Epic, I would have like a, that immediate lunch. I would have another lunch. I would have a meal in between lunch and dinner. I would have dinner. And then after dinner, I would have another like small meal as well. So like, and that's, that was the only way for me to stay on top of things. We aren't burning quite as many calories cause it's not as long, but mm-hmm. Still a lot. So I'm just planning on eating myself and it won't be fun. Um, Ivy will document what we eat maybe sometimes for people and show them 
you know, how much work it takes just to eat through a stage race. So good plan. Uh, yeah. All right. So that's the plan. Um, the race itself and looking ahead at the stages, I just want to cover this. Uh, so the one that actually ends up having the most climbing to it is going to be stage three. And I think stage three and stage four, where we're going to have like, uh, some like technical terrain too. And it's the highest elevation three and four are going to be kind of like the crux to make it over. I feel like, uh, and then we have stage five, which is a new terrain and stage six in Canmore, which is almost like it seems it's at a Nordic skiing area. So I think it's going to feel a bit more XEO and it's way, sh and it's shorter than the rest of the days. So like our longest day is 30 miles or 48 kilometers. And our shortest day is that last one. It's 21.9 miles or 35 kilometers, but it climbs significantly less than every other stage. That last one. So if the last one will be fast, it'll be shorter. I'm expecting us to finish that one like significantly shorter than the other stages. Um, I'm just so excited. It's going to be an absolute blast. Is there any part or do you know the course well enough yet to know of like a certain spot that you're looking forward to the most? No, the last day, because it'll be <laughs> if I make it to the, the last day and I'm <laughs> and I'm happy and like, yeah, you know, yeah. I'm able to finish with some gas in the tank. I'll be so stoked. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I also am looking forward to last day for that same reason. <laughs> Uh, I'm looking forward to stage three and four because I think that those are the ones that like uh, are supposedly like the hardest uh, ones. Uh, stage three in particular has like the technical one. I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, I can't wait. Um, those are the ones I'm looking forward to. It's going to be amazing. Yeah. I can't wait. Uh, we'll share what we learn all throughout this uh, with daily podcasts that are going to be mini podcasts, short ones from Ivy and I talking about if we screwed up what we screwed up and what we learned from it, if we did something great, what we learned from that, and if we're going to do more of it. Uh, so stay tuned. It's going to be a blast. Anything else to add, Ivy? Pray for me. Thank you so much. <laughs> Pray for <laughs> Ivy. It's going to be awesome. Show Ivy your support. Follow <laughs> along with us on Trainer Road's Instagram. You can find us there or on our YouTube channel. You can watch the videos. And of course, you can get the podcast wherever you get the podcast. Share and rate it. Um, if you enjoy us doing this sort of content and like guinea pigging ourselves or uh, dog fooding as they call it and going <laughs> and doing it our own on our own, uh, we'd appreciate the support. It's kind of nerve wracking racing in front of over a hundred thousand people. So, um, any support you can give, we appreciate it. And we'll talk to you all from stage one. Ooh. Thanks y'all. Thanks. <laughs>